The title of our next session is Using Genomic Tools to Interrogate Infectious Diseases and Genetic Disorders in Southern Nevada. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Edwin O, oh, our speaker uh, for today on this very interesting topic. You can find his uh, complete bio and information about Dr. O oh on the attendee website under the bio tab. This session is a CEU accredited. Uh, you can see the disclosure statement here, as well as the full disclosures of Dr. O on the attendee website and on this slide, as well as our learning objectives. So with no further ado, Dr. O, take us away. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today and share some of our stories with you on how we're using sequencing technologies to look at various uh, neurodevelopmental conditions and also um, for examining uh, COVID-19 and other pathogens uh, in Southern Nevada. Um, please just give me a few seconds as I get things up and running. Let's see. All right. Okay, all right, well, um, again, uh, uh, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us uh, for this uh, presentation. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, genomic tools and, and how we've used this in Southern Nevada. So um, I, I tend to nag a lot. So I, I always like to uh, start off my presentation by acknowledging the folks who've uh, given me the opportunity to um, <laughs> sit here and, and talk. Um, a lot of uh, what I'll be showing you over the last 30 minutes have has really been the culmination of work that has happened um, in the last four years. And I've had the pleasure of working together with a, a, a whole number of undergraduates, graduate students, um, postdocs, and uh, junior faculty in the lab. And um, over the next, again, 30 minutes, you're gonna see how um, we've uh, worked together with our undergraduates shown here uh, to examine uh, COVID-19 and, um, and various neurodevelopmental conditions in, in the Valley. And a lot of the work here is driven by a talented junior uh, faculty in the lab, Dr. Van Vo and a bioinformatician, uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Harrington. So um, in addition to, to the group, we were also fortunate to collaborate with a, a number of folks um, in Southern Nevada. And, and really as a result of COVID-19, um, we started a number of collaborations with, um, with folks uh, around here again and in, in the state of Nevada, uh, including the Southern Nevada Water Authority, um, the Health District, um, folks also up in uh, Reno, up in UNR, and the public health labs, and also in Arizona. And everything that we've uh, really learned about um, wastewater surveillance uh, for respiratory pathogens has, has been the result of conversations with uh, environmental engineers, such as Dan Garrity and Katerina Papp, and uh, learning about epidemiology together with uh, folks in the health district, um, Dr. Lockett and uh, Kimberly Franning. And we're really fortunate to be funded by NIH, um, CDC, and the state of uh, Nevada. So traditionally, over the last 10 years, my, my lab has had an interest in interrogating a role for what's called the primary cilium in uh, development and disease. And this structure is shown here on the right. Uh, this is a cartoon depicting the microtubule um, structure in a primary cilium. And this is a image, a transmission electron uh, micrograph of what the structure would look like. It's approximately uh, two to three microns long in some cell types and about one micron uh, wide. This is a structure that is present in just about every cell type in uh, you and I. And um, over the last 10, 20 years, uh, we and others have shown that the structure is absolutely important uh, for uh, development and the response to various paracrine signaling pathways. Now we started uh, examining a role for cilia by uh, removing uh, genes that, um, who, that give rise to protein products that, um, that make up this structure here um, on the right. And what we found 
in the rodent, when we started uh, removing these genes, making knockout animals, was a whole host of uh, different phenotypes that range from anosmia, or the loss of smell, to retinal degeneration due to uh, the loss of rod and cone photoreceptors, uh, to craniofacial changes, uh, polydactyly, or the, you know, the addition of extra digits, um, obesity, and, and also cancer. And so after making these rodent um, animals, we, we started collaborating with a number of clinicians across the country. And we realized that when you remove or when you have mutations in these same genes that we removed in mice, um, that we started also seeing a, a similar range of uh, human phenotypes um, um, that pretty much mimicked what we were seeing in, in, the, in the mice. And again, this range from polydactyly to retinal degeneration. And so I think what was really key in a lot of these uh, initial discoveries um, in humans was the use of sequencing tools, next generation sequencing tools uh, that allowed us to identify genes that could give rise to human conditions. And what we've done in various reviews over the years is that we've listed these genes um, that give rise to these human diseases, and we've um, categorized these uh, human diseases as being either relatively mild uh, to relatively severe. Relatively mild here is purely subjective in the sense that when we lose the function of one gene, we start to see one organ system failing in uh, humans and also in mice. Um, to relatively severe, where we remove a gene that gives rise to a protein product that's uh, important for cilia function. Um, and when we do that, uh, for some genes, uh, this gives rise to uh, death or uh, death shortly after birth. And uh, there are a number of conditions that have been listed as a result of these um, sequencing and ultimately functional genomics uh, tests. And so um, while I've been an, an assistant professor at Duke University um, in the years before, we examined how these ciliary proteins could interact with other uh, proteins that were giving rise to neurodevelopmental diseases. And we've identified a host of other uh, proteins, one of which I'm going to go into in the next uh, five minutes or so. So over the next um, um, 20 minutes or so, I'm, I'd like to uh, share two main uh, learning objectives where uh, we're going to discuss how CNVs or copy number variations can be resolved using um, sequencing functional genomic tools. And in objective two, how we've used these tools uh, to interrogate uh, COVID-19 using clinical and wastewater samples. So a, a number of key findings occurred um, over, over the last uh, five years or so that helped us um, focus on uh, a condition, a copy number variant that I'm going to uh, discuss. And, and here are the two papers that were really key. In the first paper on the left, in this molecular cell paper, what the authors demonstrated was that if you um, decrease the amount of USP7 in a cell, this gave rise to a number of cell biology phenotypes. And uh, what these authors also showed was that in humans, when you have deletions in the genome that encompasses this gene, and or if you have mutations in this gene called USP7, uh, you start to see a number of neurodevelopmental um, uh, phenotypes that include uh, uh, GI issues and seizures. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, uh, a number of the same authors in the molecular cell paper then showed uh, that if you examined humans, that um, again, uh, a whole a host of uh, additional deletions encompassing USP7 and um, at least another three or four or five genes could also give rise to a very, very similar phenotype in humans. And so what got us interested in this condition was that at uh, Duke, we started to see humans with a duplication in this locus. Um, and this was rather interesting, right? Because what I've mentioned is um, so far is that there uh, were deletions that were reported. And the um, fascinating thing here was that in characterizing these humans, um, that the uh, phenotypes in the individuals with duplications very much mimicked what we were seeing in humans with the presumptive loss of function mutations and the deletions in the locus. 
And in these individuals with a duplication, we also observed four or five genes. So this really got us interested and started working on USP7. And the reason we started working on USP7 was that we went into the locus in the lab, and what we did was we overexpressed and we deleted four or five of these different genes in the locus, and we started seeing USP7 as being a driver of phenotypes that made sense to us. And so this um, started a, a number of studies uh, in looking at USP7 function in the nervous system. At this point, maybe four years ago, three, four years ago, uh, a lot had been known about USP7, but most of the uh, information in the literature was focusing on a role for USP7 in cancer. So we wanted to know, based on the human genetics, what might happen when you have too much USP7, when you have USP7 with a uh, mutation, or when you have too much USP7. We wanted to know signaling pathways um, that were regulated by USP7 and what happens in neurons uh, when you regulate your, uh, USP7. So the first thing that we started doing was running uh, mass spec uh, type of experiments. We wanted to know what USP7 was interacting with in the brain. Again, as I mentioned, uh, much of the uh, studies prior uh, to when we entered into this field had focused on how USP7 was regulating um, other cell types outside of the brain. And we were fascinated that when we started looking at the interaction uh, interactome that uh, a number of key uh, signaling pathways highlighted here in yellow uh, were lit up. So as a result of um, these mass spec um, experiments, um, we wanted to then ask this question, well, if USP7 is interacting with these proteins, is that uh, important? Um, because one thing I have not mentioned is that USP7 has been characterized as an enzyme that removes ubiquitin from proteins. So it's what's called a DUB or a deubiquitinating enzyme. So when an enzyme interacts with a protein, um, is that more of a trafficking function or is that interaction the result of a protein like USP7 removing ubiquitin from, a, uh, from the protein? thus defining that interaction more of an enzymatic type of reaction and that interactor as a substrate. So using uh, hippocampal neurons, we um, inhibited USB7 with um, these uh, small molecules. We also used a short hairpin to reduce USB7. Um, and we also had uh, patient-induced NPCs or neural precursor cells, and we also expressed uh, USB7. And the interesting thing here is that uh, many of the proteins that we found, again, were involved in synaptic signaling and uh, tRNAs, uh, tRNA synthesis uh, function. So this led to a hypothesis that, hey, maybe USB7 um, in the brain is actually required to stabilize uh, USB7 is required to remove ubiquitin from proteins, and when those uh, proteins don't have ubiquitin anymore, they stay in the cell. They're not removed from the cell. And as a result, um, if those proteins are important for synaptic signaling, then we're going to have a lot more of that type of signaling, excitatory and inhibitory signaling. So we um, performed a number of experiments in hippocampal neurons where we ended up um, overexpressing USP7. We expressed a uh, mutation of USP7, uh, two known mutations in USP7 that have been found in humans. And the interesting uh, finding for us was that when you overexpress USP7, um, a protein known as Homer, Homer is a protein that's important at um, the synapse for uh, mobilizing and stabilizing a number of receptors. Uh, for synaptic signaling, we started to see that Homer was increasing in neurons. And when we compare this to the mutants of USP7, uh, we found that these mutants uh, did not lead to as much Homer in these neurons. So this suggested to us that when you have too much of USP7, uh, certain substrates such as Homer1 uh, may be upregulated. And this uh, may be a key feature in humans where if you have the mutants, um, we're not seeing that phenotype, at least in the in vitro cultures that we're examining. So now we wanted to ask, okay, well, um, what happens if we inhibit USB7 with a uh, chemical inhi inhibitor 
or if we overexpressed that USP7. And we also, again, here started seeing that same yin and yang type of phenotype, where if you uh, inhibited USP7, we observed less Homer 1 in these neurons. And when we overexpressed USP7, we started to see an increase of uh, Homer relative, again, to the control. So uh, when there was too much USP7, we were seeing Homer. And when there's too little, we were seeing uh, less of Homer in these neurons. So given this phenotype and given that Homer 1 is responsible for stabilizing receptors at the synapse, we then wanted to, to run some functional assays where we would culture these neurons that have been treated to these various conditions of either too little of USP7 or too much of these of USP7 or ex these neurons expressing these mutants and asking how might these um, conditions, this perturbation affect uh, the uh, action potentials in neurons that are cultured. And so we use this system, which is a maestro system where um, you can culture uh, neurons on um, in a 24 well uh, um, setup. These are neurons here uh, shown on the right, and these are electrodes shown in, in black. And so when these neurons are sitting on these electrodes, we can record activity uh, from these neurons. And the interesting thing here is that I'm, I'm going to briefly just mention that when we uh, inhibit USP7 or we overexpress USP7, we see, we see very different phenotypes from the control. And we think that these changes in action potential may be very relevant to what we're seeing in humans when we think about seizure activity. So um, in summary, for at least this part of the talk, um, what, what, I've, um, what I've shared with you today is that at least what we're thinking in the lab right now is that USP7s, at least in the in vitro condition also, seems to be very, very critical, where too much or too little um, may be giving rise to uh, um, phenotypes um, that are... Um, that can model what we're seeing in humans. And I think this is really, really key because in certain human diseases where we have a removal of half of this protein um, or when we have uh, too much of this protein, uh, many of us think about uh, gene therapy where we're going to put in a gene or we're going to remove, uh, find ways to remove the gene. So I, I think what our findings uh, tell us is that titrating the amount of the gene that we put back uh, in order to rescue um, phenotypes is absolutely key. Um, we have to not only strive to be delivering these genes to uh, the various appropriate cell type, but we have to be striving to deliver the appropriate dose um, otherwise, we may end up with no rescue of what um, we're trying to examine. And I think one of the uh, common themes here is that um, uh, synaptic signaling, something that hasn't been identified thus far in USP7 or associated with USP7 function, is a key area that we're, that we're going to be looking at for, um, for the next uh, uh, few years. And so now we're looking at um, various um, uh, mutations in USP7. I showed you two of these variants, and uh, we're looking at a whole host of uh, these other variants now that have been identified in humans. And we think what will be important is uh, taking these um, skin fibroblasts that we have from our collaborators and turning them into neurons and then running these types of in vitro assays to better understand how we can uh, potentially rescue phenotypes. And um, we're moving forward in trying to work with um, other folks to identify um, individuals with um, duplications and deletions in this part of the genome. Um, when I started working on this a few years ago, the 16P13.2 locus had been identified as an area with deletions and duplications. But for the most part, um, this duplication uh, was uh, not considered as being something actionable. I think uh, moving forward, we're going to find that that's going to be very, very different. So um, in April 2020, uh, like 
many other people in the field, um, our uh, studies uh, in human genetics had to uh, be paused um, because of COVID-19. Um, and while our studies had, um, had to be uh, put on the pause mode, we felt that we did not want to pause our activities in the lab. And we had the, um, um, the, the capacity to um, help out with the public health folks in sequencing. Um, um, SARS-CoV-2. We have been used to sequencing genomes. You and I, we have 3 billion nucleotides. When we thought of SARS-CoV-2 having a genome of 30,000 nucleotides, we thought this was going to be extremely easy, especially with the approach that we had uh, that we had uh, proposed. And boy, were we wrong when um, we thought that this was going to be easy. So after working together with uh, folks in the public health labs, we were sequencing genomes from individual clinical samples and finding, um, finding that we could uh, uh, provide uh, genome sequences. But we started working with an environmental engineer and we wanted to sequence SARS-CoV-2 from wastewater. And the reason why we wanted to sequence SARS-CoV-2 from the wastewater was really because of this key information here on this slide, where on the x-axis we're seeing time, this is March of 2020 uh, to May of 2020, and on the right side of this graph in the y-axis, um, this is the number of new cases shown here in these blue bars. And on the left side of this y-axis with the cumulative cases shown here in this uh, red line here. And the real key piece of information for us was that as the number of new cases were increasing every week, if we went into the wastewater and extracted viral um, RNA and DNA, we were able to um, observe SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA in those wastewater samples that were pretty much tracking what we were seeing with new cases in Southern Nevada. So this was um, this blew my mind and I, I was really uh, surprised by a lot of these findings, um, again, in collaboration with uh, Dan Garrity and Katarina Papp. So um, uh, Dan uh, made sure to tell me that, um, Ed, this, this is not too surprising um, because uh, back in the day, um, wastewater has been used uh, for, for the last 30 or 40 years uh, to examine a number of uh, other respiratory pathogens that, that have been present in infected individuals. And he reminded me that in the case of poliomyelitis, um, individuals who are infected with this virus don't have symptoms. And this was really similar to what we were seeing with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I think what, um, um, what really uh, got me interested was that uh, similar to what Dan was showing for SARS-CoV-2 back in the 90s in, uh, in this Japanese group, um, what they were finding was that in uh, various parts of the year, October, November, December of 93, they were finding three different subtypes of polio virus, and uh, they were seeing it in uh, November, in the summer, again towards the end of the year, and again in summer. And they were seeing decreasing levels of polio uh, virus. So uh, using wastewater and examining viral pathogens was not necessarily new, but I think what we wanted to do uh, together with the environmental folks was to introduce the use of wastewater genomics, of sequencing tools um, in interrogating viral pathogens and potentially other pathogens, bacterial fungal pathogens in the wastewater. NGS has really only been around and accessible for many of us um, over the last uh, 15 years or so. And so we wanted to ask, could we sequence SARS-CoV-2 from wastewater? So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I wanted to show two uh, vignettes with you where we've worked together with Dan and we've sequenced wastewater samples. So um, because we could uh, show that wastewater um, would be a good sample to look at SARS-CoV-2 in this really, really small uh, sample set, we decided to uh, examine this virus in uh, Southern Nevada. Southern Nevada is made up of 2.4 million people and boy, we have 1 million uh, visitors, or at least uh, we usually have 1 million visitors uh, during every week uh, during the year uh, prior to COVID. And so we looked at various wastewater treatment plants, which is shown here on the left. We looked at um, uh, seven or eight different wastewater treatment plants. And the bottom line of this image here is that anytime we saw an increase in clinical cases, we were seeing an increase in wastewater viral amounts. 
But that's not the only key point. Whenever we saw a decrease in clinical cases in Southern Nevada, we also saw a decrease in that viral content. So it was clear to us that we could track infections, uh, human infections by looking at wastewater. And so because we could look and um, identify the presence or absence of this pathogen in wastewater, we wanted to ask, could we also track the increasing or decreasing amounts of a viral pathogens? And this image is the result of about eight months worth of work where we ended up sequencing wastewater. And at the top of the uh, slide, this is a cartoon of what you would typically see for um, the genome. Um, and this is a cartoon of the B117 or the alpha variant or the variant that was first found in the UK. And here are locations where we typically find the signature mutations. And uh, many of us are aware of this um, part of the genome or the spike uh, gene where there are many signature mutations that either increase or decrease the binding of this virus to uh, the ACE2 receptor in human cells. So here is what we would typically see uh, in an individual uh, sample for, that's infected by the alpha variant. Um, again, uh, th these are the locations where we find the mutations. And the interesting thing is that we found these mutations in wastewater samples. And the key here is that we found these uh, mutations as early as December of 2020. Now, because we can do this for alpha, we can also do this for um, other variants. And we also found this, um, these uh, samples that were positive for the B.1.429 sample uh, mutation or variant. And this is the variant that was first found in California or better known as Epsilon. And as you can see here, what I've listed in yellow is that these uh, variants were found in wastewater as early as December of 2020. Now, when you compare this wastewater sampling to clinical genome sequencing, um, the key thing here was that we did not find B117 or what's shown here in blue until January of 2021. Similarly, we did not find Epsilon until January of 2021. And we started to see an increase of these variants over time, the brown and the blue. And we only found, uh, and we started finding um, these variants in the wastewater, remember as early as December of 2020. Now, a key point here to note is that our sample size in 2020 was extremely low for clinical samples. So chances are th that if we had um, been sequencing at high volume in 2020, we would have found it. But I think that sort of um, shows you and, and, and sort of delivers that point that when you don't have resources or when you don't have the ability to sequence clinical samples, wastewater uh, sampling would have given us the result that these variants were circulating. So we've gone about um, and we've uh, looked at all of the samples over uh, 2021 and we've identified uh, Delta, Mu and Lambda either earlier or at the same time as when we identified our first human infections in Nevada. So a key question that we're often asked is, did we get lucky? Or worse, uh, did we accidentally cheat? Did we know what we were going to uh, expect in clinical samples? And so together uh, with a number of different public health uh, uh, collaborators, um, we wanted to examine the emergence and the displacement of various Omicron variants in wastewater in Southern Nevada. So what you see here, um, uh, is, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what, what you see here is the, um, uh, the public health surveillance of, of samples, where this is sequencing of January of 2022 to February of 2022 to March of 22, all the way to June. And uh, what you're seeing here in this uh, graph is that BA1 is present in the area and BA1 gets displaced by the orange or BA.2, and then eventually starts getting displaced by the other variants. We wanted to compare this sequencing of clinical cases with wastewater samples. And uh, this is what we observed with wastewater samples. We could also see a similar pattern of BA.1 being displaced by other variants over time. And so the key comparison was really uh, looking at the two, public health uh, surveillance and wastewater surveillance. 
And really the, the key comparison here, when you put the two uh, data sets together was that we were finding BA1, BA2 a lot sooner than when we were finding these variants in humans. When you start looking at 2.12.1 here in the gray, there was a lot more in the wastewater before finding uh, them in the samples. And again, uh, for BA.5, we're seeing very, very few, very late, um, but in the wastewater, it's, it's almost as if once we start to see 50% of, or 50 to 100% of all genomes in wastewater dominated by a variant, we only start to identify our first few humans with this variant. Now, I don't think there's anything um, uh, magical about wastewater surveillance. I think the, the key thing here is that um, if public health surveillance um, is limited because of resources, you're going to see a greater delay in these numbers in humans uh, show up um, as a result of sequencing versus the wastewater. And uh, we've worked together with the state and we've developed this website where we've um, entered um, all of the information that we collect from Las Vegas, from a lot of the urban sites in Las Vegas, and also um, the, some of the rural sites outside of Las Vegas. And the interesting thing here is that whenever we see a variant um, show up in uh, Las Vegas, within a couple of weeks or so, we start to see these variants circulate out to uh, various locations, various uh, rural locations. So wastewater surveillance has been a fantastic way for us to be able to go in to track not only the emergence of these uh, variants and of this pathogen, but really the evolution of this uh, variant as it makes its way uh, through uh, various different geographic uh, regions in Southern Nevada. So um, I'm running out of time. So I, I'm, I'm going to probably skip a lot of the um, other parts, but I really wanted to just um, um, summarize some of our findings in that what I've shown you is that we've, um, been looking at um, sequencing across wastewater facilities, but we can also go very much closer uh, to buildings. Um, every building that we occupy, every home that we occupy, that wastewater, once we flush, enters into a wastewater treatment plant. So a wastewater treatment plant can be representative of 10,000 people or of 1 million people, which is in the case of Clark County in Southern Nevada, where we have a wastewater treatment plant. Um, that, that services that many people. Um, being able to get information about 1 million people it is relevant. However, we want to get closer to uh, various communities to better understand how these variants might be spreading. For example, if we wanted to understand if a variant showed up at the Las Vegas Strip, we would want to have that information in advance. And the only way to be able to do that is to access manholes as we, as we get closer. Uh, to uh, locations like the Strip or a convention center or a hotel or a dormitory. Um, what we've also done is we've uh, worked together with um, um, stormwater uh, drained um, um, officials. And this is rather key for an urban city like uh, Las Vegas, where we have individuals, um, um, homeless, uh, unsheltered homeless individuals who occupy um, these uh, tunnels um, below the city and um, the stormwater is the result of rain or water that feeds in from golf courses that ultimately end up um, in lakes. And so um, this is the bathroom for uh, many individuals um, in these tunnels. And so we've also looked at these, uh, these samples and we found mutations in these samples in the stormwater that we've never identified in any uh, human cohort across the world. So there is a lot of, um, public health surveillance that's not done right now to identify mutations or even reservoirs of mutations and pathogens um, that might be relevant uh, to human diseases. So I think because um, I am running out of time, I, I, I'm going to uh, stop here and I'd be more than happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. O. You have taken us on a journey behind the scenes in a sophisticated research lab to stormwater. What a mar marvelous thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are a couple of sets of questions we have a bit of time for. 
Um, the first, we have some scientists clearly on uh, online with us today. Uh, one uh, was curious about, given the number of organs that are affected by USP7, if, do you have any information about splenic development or impact on spleens? Because there is a congenital asplenia syndrome that's been recognized. Yeah. Uh um, uh, thus, thus far, we have not um, we have not looked at the spleen as much. The, the focus has been mainly the nervous system because of this unexplored uh, domain um, when we first entered. Um, very little was known about USP7 other than, well, this is a protein that might be in the nucleus and might be affecting gene transcription. Um, we wanted to bring this to the synapse, um, a, a place that was... Uh, uh, not very well understood, at least in the context of this disease, and show that there was a good association between mutations and pathology. All right, thank you for that. And along those same lines, in the world of GWAS and looking for SNPs, are you aware of or have you collaborated with or looked into data sets where SNPs in the USP7 are showing up in maybe unexpected places? Um, so, so yes and no. Uh, so, as I mentioned, USP7 is an enzyme, and so any type of mutations within a catalytic, catalytic domain of an enzyme um, is more likely to affect the function of this protein um, or of any protein that's an enzyme. However, there is a big chunk of the USP7 structure, gene structure, that does not code for um, enzymatic function. And so we've been finding mutations outside of this um, enzymatic uh, domain that uh, does seem to be also associated with similar phenotypes that we're seeing in humans. However, these phenotypes are somewhat more mild in some individuals and is somewhat more uh, severe in other individuals. And so like many of us here, uh, we're extremely curious about genotype phenotype correlations where how might these mutations might be, how might these mutations influence perhaps the binding of the protein, which might either open up the enzyme more or might close up the enzyme, thus restricting this enzyme from doing what it's supposed to do. And so using, uh, I think, a number of functional genomic assays in the lab um, and also working together with structural biologists, I think we can better um, under understand how, uh, how mutations might uh, result in phenotypes. Excellent. Uh, and, and then finally, I think uh, there was a mention you, in your introduction uh, about how USP7 is something that's thought about in the world of malignancy. And put on, if you will, a translational hat. Um, have you observed anything in the models that you have, or would you advise you know, an individual who's found to have this uh, dysregulation about um, monitoring for malignancies going forward? Is there a linkage here that we, we ought to be aware of that you can help inform? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I, I think that's so key, right? Because what we're seeing in neural developmental conditions right now is that either too little or too much might give rise to a neural developmental condition. Whereas in the field of cancer, um, mutations in USP7 have um, typically uh, resulted in too much of USP7 function. And that leads to a, um, a, a condition which is associated with cancer. So I think in, in that type of scenario where we have too much USP7 with cancer and too much USP7 with uh, neural developmental conditions, I think what we're really going to be able to do now is take advantage of these tools that have been, um, that have been developed in, can in the can field of cancer and apply it to the field of neurodevelopment. And um, so I think with the tools, we're, we're, we're potentially in a good place. I think for clinical phenotyping, we need to be in a better place um, to, to be um, absolutely sure that what we're seeing in the brain is also gonna be something similar that what we're seeing um, across uh, various organs um, in, in humans that are, that are showing too much or even too little of USP7. Fascinating. Let's turn in the last couple of minutes to wastewater. Who knew where we would go in the course of this presentation? Thank you again. So um, there's a couple of questions uh, as regards, uh, for example, the storm wastewater, the persons who are utilizing other than, uh, you know, uh, the, the, those who are experiencing homelessness, uh, housing insecurity. Do, uh, do you know if the Department of Health is looking at sort of the demographics of where you're getting you know, wastewater from, and does that relate to sort of the nature or characteristic of the epidemic? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, every every month, I think we and others are discovering new ways to interrogate wastewater and stormwater samples. And every month, it's been a oh my goodness, you can do that um, type of uh, conclusion when we um, take these samples, extract nucleic acids from these samples, and say, "Holy cow, we can find monkeypox!" or "Holy cow, we can find RSV!" Um, and of course, in the initial days, "Holy cow." We can still find SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA in wastewater one week, two weeks, three weeks after it's been deposited in the wastewater. Many of us in the lab, when we work with RNA, we can barely keep it stable for a couple of hours <laughs> in under very, very controlled situations. And yet here we are where we can take wastewater, uh, stormwater, and be able to extract um, um, such samples. So um, I, I think we're, we're still um, figuring out how far we can go with this type of surveillance system. And um, in the meantime, um, I, I think some of what we've been able to uh, um, um, identify, some of the things that we've been able to identify is that yes, you can um, um, extract viral RNA, even if it's a few days or a few weeks after, especially for SARS-CoV-2. Um, for monkeypox, it's been a bit surprising to us that the stability of a uh, DNA virus has been uh, not as good uh, versus SARS-CoV-2. There, there's something to do with how these viruses are enveloped um, and then um, how they are then um, transported in this complex matrix. Interesting. And let's just end on a, a sort of a broader societal note. You've got some people thinking about you're standing outside their home, seeing what's coming out of their drain pipe. Are there uh, what's the equipoise that you would see between surveillance, public health needs, et cetera, and sort of invading people's private space, potentially privacy concerns? Yeah, yeah. So, so especially with stormwater, we we really didn't think we would be able to get um, uh, extract SARS-CoV-2 from from um, these samples because in Vegas we we get up to 115 degrees and it gets pretty warm out here. <laughs> um, and and so when you go into the waste into stormwater and extract that 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 water is pretty hot already. So um, whether it was cold or whether it was warm, we found that we were still able to um, um, detect um, SARS-CoV-2. With regards to consent, this is this is I think a a field that's going to evolve. I think into a very very um, important and interesting debate. How far can we should we go with such um, surveillance techniques? For example, if we knew that monkeypox was prevalent in a certain community, should we have the ability to extract wastewater from that community and provide these results? Because we could imagine in some situations, this might lead to a lockdown in that uh, community. And in other situations, um, I think then we might be able to consider um, other type of messaging and or testing or vaccination strategies for that community. And I, I hope, um, I think many people can imagine, I, I'm more on this side of the camp where this type of information actually empowers us to be able to provide resources, very uh, limited resources to areas that need the help more, that need the messaging more, that need the information about, okay, should you want to get vaccinated? Here is that facility. Here are the resources to be able to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. O. It's been a wonderful presentation and we greatly appreciate your participation in our summit this year. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.